want you to know that if Christ is in you, you are a lot stronger than you know. You are giving, given something that is utterly limitless in its power. And I want you this morning to discover what that means in your life, particularly when little things or big things that, that feel like deaths uh, happen, what that actually does in your life, and why you can stop worrying today about what's going to happen tomorrow. Jesus tells us this. In the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 6, one of the most famous parts of the Sermon on the Mount, one of my favorite parts, uh, he says, uh, but seek first, what? His kingdom and his righteousness, then what? All these things will be given to you as well. All these things he's talking about are you know, health issues, material issues, opportunities, etc. Every Bible scholar, as uncomfortable it is to read that, would agree that the context of this passage is that when you seek first his righteousness, you'll have everything you need, your daily bread. And then he goes on to say, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. That passage is not standalone. It's built on the passage that precedes it. That if we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, we don't need to worry about tomorrow. And this is at the heart of what it means to live a worry-free life. There is no way to just choose to like stop worrying all the time, especially if you know, you're in a bad, bad spot, you know? If you're in a war zone, how do you just not worry, you know? If, you, if you've got kids, how do you not worry, you know? And the answer is basically this, that we have to discover within ourselves the Paschal mystery, which I'll get to in a second. We have to stop trying to figure out what's gonna happen tomorrow, because even though tomorrow is known by God, it cannot be known by us. And so we experience the world as chaos, the worst things that have ever happened to people, they didn't see it coming. When we base the worst thing that can happen tomorrow based on the worst thing that happened yesterday, that's also a mistake in risk management. So first of all, we have to just understand we will never be able to predict all the horrible, terrible things that are gonna happen tomorrow. And we're also gonna be unable to predict all the wonderful, marvelous, and miraculous things that are gonna happen in our lives tomorrow. We simply need to not worry about tomorrow. Well, how do we do that? It's not by trying harder. It's by becoming paschal, by becoming anti-fragile. In other words, it's by discovering that within us, we were given a gift. And that gift is simply this. Anytime you are harmed, anytime you are attacked, anytime you experience a death in your life, if you respond with faith, new life will spring forth from it. That is the Paschal Mystery. The Paschal Mystery is an ancient Christian thing. It's not a new idea, it's an old idea that's been forgotten. We only talk about it on Easter. But the Paschal Mystery is that when things in Christ die, they will come back to life with greater power. This then seeps into all of our lives. So when you were baptized, you were given death. Did you know that you were given the death of Christ? but you are also given the life of Christ. So that for you as a believer, when you experience pain, anguish, death, loss, if you respond with faith, the promise is that the Paschal life within you will spring forth into new life. This is what Jesus is talking about when he says John, in John chapter 12, verse 24, very truly I tell you, Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. He's talking about his own death there. Or in 2 Corinthians 7 through 12, the passage says, uh, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. Paul is talking to the church now to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Do you know what that all-surpassing power is he's talking about there, by the way? In the first century church, they were healing the sick, 
raising the dead. They were prophesying. They were operating in the gifts of the Spirit, as well as great gifts of encouragement. The first century church didn't have the New Testament. Did you know that? They wrote the New Testament because of the all-surpassing power that was within them. So if you want that in your life, you can have it in your life, and this is the answer. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. Why? So that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. What is he talking about there? The Paschal mystery. And that even when we die, we are given the life of Christ in our death. Isn't that amazing? If you don't know Christ, when you come to face the judgment seat of the Father, you will have to show him your resume. The good you did and the bad you did, and you'll be judged based on that. But if you are a believer, you show him Jesus' resume. You show him what Christ did on your behalf. So that he who knew no sin became sin, that we could be called what? The righteousness of God. I don't know about you. I don't want God to judge me based on my resume. I want to take, if I get to choose between my resume and Jesus' resume, I'm choosing Christ's resume. How about you? And that's precisely what it means to be saved. It means that the, the death in the life with, of Jesus is within us. But don't miss that. You can't have the life of Jesus without also embracing what? His death. Living within his death means living within his life. You take that paschal mystery. So I want you to know this. You are paschal. You are anti-fragile. The, the, the thing the enemy wants most in the life of believers is to keep them comfy. There is, rest is good. Good meals are good. But we also must understand that in life, it is the punches, it is trouble that makes us more like Jesus. It is pain, it is obstacles. As Marcus Aurelius said, fire feeds on obstacles. So does a believer. And this is precisely what it means to be Pascal or in Taleb's philosophy, anti-fragile. Now, I love uh, Taleb, who, by the way, is a Christian and loves to describe this idea as anti-fragile. And of course, there's lots of things, you know, that, that are anti-fragile both in myth and in real life. Of course, probably the most well-known anti-fragile character in American myth is the Incredible Hulk, right? I mean, everybody knows, you know, just once Hulk starts smashing, don't shoot him. Don't attack him. Just leave him alone. Sing him a lullaby. Hulk is the ultimate anti-fragile mythological character, you know, Hulk, Hulk the better he gets, the stronger he gets. And, and there, there are real things in life that are anti-fragile. Bamboo is anti-fragile. If you've been cursed with having bamboo grow in your backyard, <laughs> do not cut down bamboo or you're gonna get 10 times more in its place. <laughs> Trees are anti-fragile to a degree. If you cut branches off a tree, it'll become stronger, right? bigger, more green. Even a forest itself is anti-fragile. A whole forest burns down. A new, stronger, better force, forest will replace it, right? Greek fire is anti-fragile. Jiu-jitsu is anti-fragile. You know, jiu-jitsu, you use the inertia of your opponent, the attacks of your opponent against them. Without them attacking you, jiu-jitsu is useless. The human body itself is anti-fragile, right? I mean, Exercising with weights, you're literally damaging the muscle fibers in your body so that they become tougher, stronger, and you can lift more weights. So anti-fragile means that when you attack something, it comes back stronger. It doesn't merely stay the same. Love is anti-fragile. If your daughter is dating a boy and you don't like him, the worst thing you can do for that love relationship is to help tell him, stop dating that boy, he's trouble, right? <laughs> It's anti-fragile, love is anti-fragile. The best thing you can do is to say, 
he's a sweet boy. If you want to like break up with him, he's a sweet boy. You should see him more. When was the last time you called him? That's how you destroy your teenager's relationship. You don't understand. It's, it's, it's just like putting a wet blanket on her. She's like, oh, do I like him? I don't know. I don't know. You are anti-fragile. And this is the antidote to worrying, is to understand that if bad things happen to you tomorrow, they're going to help you. This is what it means to be Paschal. Jesus Christ is the most anti-fragile being who has ever existed and ever will exist. Jesus Christ is the epitome of what it means to be anti-fragile. When they cursed him, when they said, lied about him, when they said that he was sent by demons, more people followed him, more people talked about him. The more they attacked him, the more popular he got until finally they crucified him, which as his enemies was the worst thing you can do to Jesus if you want to get rid of him. And through his death and resurrection, new life poured out into the universe. Everything changed. And in that moment, A.D. and B.C., time was snapped in two like a twig, one author said, in his, his death. Because that was the moment the grip of sin uh, began to lose its grip on your life and on my life. The cross, the cross is the ultimate anti-fragility that life came into our world through it. And we're so thankful for the obedience of Christ on the cross. Thank you, Jesus. And of course, the church inherited that paschal anti-fragility that the church in its inception was persecuted, enslaved, beaten, and it just spread like Greek fire. You watch, it's like in the first and second centuries of the church, when the Roman Empire enslaved Christians and, and like shipped them around Europe, they were just spreading Christianity around. They weren't destroying it. That's why Tertullian said, the blood of martyrs is seed. That's why I said, if you wanna see a church grow, make it illegal. Persecute it, throw Christians in jail, and you just see that the church will grow and thrive. I remember once, there was a girl who was doing missionary work in China, and she came back to our, our old church to testify about what God was doing. This was in the 90s when it was pretty bad. And one of the great leaders of the underground church said to her, when she said, how can we pray for the church in China? She said, pray that China, that the government never stops persecuting us. He meant it. He understood that there was, that although it was evil, there was something good that happened to the church when it was harmed. Even to this day, you see other Christian leaders in the, who, by the way, the civil rights movement, which was a Christian movement led by a Baptist minister named Dr. Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, the same thing. Someone people knew was a good Christian woman who loved her neighbor, was respectable. When they put her, you know, when they showed her mug shot, it made people crazy mad, and they should have been, because everybody knew she was a good person. She was anti-fragile. So was Dr. King. So is every Christian movement that is truly Christian. Everything that is good, that is loved by God and known by God is, is anti-fragile. Isn't that good news? You are anti-fragile. Many of us, we forget this. We forget that it's trouble, it's the hardships, it's the punches that very often make us better. This is the cure to worrying, is to recognizing our anti-fragility. And that's very, very good news. You are so much stronger than you know because of Christ who lives in you. It's like a... Mithridatism, do you know that word? It's like when you take little bits of poison so that you become immune to the poison. That's how you stop worrying about poison. And that's how you stop worrying about life. So the first thing is uh, take some hits. Take some punches. If you haven't been, if you haven't taken little hits, little punches in a while, you, got, you just have, you, it needs to be a rhythm in your life. You need to encounter things that hurt, that stretch, 
and that pull you. Number two, love your enemies. The world, in a way, says criticize your enemies, talk badly about your enemies, lie about your enemies, get them back, assassinate, drive by, hurt, harm. This is how most people in politics um, on both sides of the aisle act. This is not how Christians act. Christians love their enemies. You want to stop worrying about your enemies? Start loving them. Um, This is what Lincoln said, actually, when he said, I defeat my enemies by making them my friends. When you start to love your enemies, you practice what Dallas Willard called spiritual jujitsu. You use the harm that they have against you. This is a core principle that Jesus taught us, to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. When you tip someone really well that gave you horrible service, when you say good things about your colleague that says bad things about you, when you're really heartbroken about your enemies and you pray for them and plead to God that he would turn their heart and change them and make them better, that's loving your enemies. And you'll watch how your worrying begins to go down. Number three, this is hard for religious people. Be vulnerable and humble. Stop pretending you're perfect. That's not helping anybody. When we... We don't have to be vulnerable, and hum- we have to be humble around every- everybody, but we don't need to be vulnerable about, ar- around everybody. Be vulnerable with your close friends and your family, with people you can trust. And be honest about the things you're wrestling with. When you are vulnerable, you become strong. That's what Jesus teaches us. He who, who tries to save his life will lose it, but he who gives his life up for my sake will save it, right? It's the opposite, it's upside down. If you wanna be strong, be vulnerable. If you want to be vulnerable and weak, be, try and pretend to be strong and tough and be a tough guy. Number four, finally, and the most important thing, you have to spend time with the master. If you want to conquer your worry and you want to become truly anti-fragile, you have to be a disciple. A disciple is someone who is disciplined. A disciple is a student. You have to be someone who spends time with the master, with Jesus, praying, thinking, reading, studying every day, This is the most important thing any being can do to be happy, successful, overjoyed, and live eternal life is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. It is the most life-giving, most important thing. It is your oxygen. Prayer is oxygen. Without it, you will die spiritually. You you need it to be alive. And uh, and it's, it's, the more you do it, the more you want it because you see the fruit of what comes from that kind of life. I want you to know that you're stronger than you think you are. I want you to know that trouble is good for you, that comfort is bad for you if you have too much of it, and and that the, the cure to worrying is to understand that God has made you an eternal being who is anti fragile, that when harm is done to you, it's only going to spring forth new life. I believe that with all my heart. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we love you, and we ask in Jesus' name that your Holy Spirit would fill our hearts and minds. Lord, that we would begin to walk in the all-powerful gifts that you gave to the first century church and to Jesus Christ himself, that we would see miracles in our workplace and in our family. Lord, that we'd be given true freedom and insight and vision, and we ask for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.